In this Debaco University video, we're looking at the importance of testing cannabis plant material for pesticide residues. All right, let's get into testing cannabis plant material for residues of pesticides. So first off, here's our research article, Role of Mass Spec in Cannabis Industry. Going to highlight some of the information presented here, but always welcome to take a look at this in more detail. So pesticide concerns. Well, pesticide residues have become a significant problem for the cannabis industry because the final product can be concentrated or burned, resulting in alterations that are not typically associated with other plant materials. As a result, the levels of pesticides and herbicides should be very low or absent in a cannabis final end product plant material. So keep in mind, this is not only an outdoor problem. A lot of people think pesticides, oh, it's for outdoor grown uh, cannabis. No, this also can be applied to the controlled indoor environments, are still subject to insect, bacterial, and fungal pests that can negatively impact plants, which could warrant the um, application of pesticides. Due to the threat of plant loss, the use of pesticides is of increased temptation by growers to ensure that they're not going to lose the crop and all the money and time that they've invested in that crop. So a lot of people go to it organically grown. Well, organic does not necessarily mean no spray. Numerous detections of low to moderate levels of pesticide contamination, tens of parts per billion or less, from a number of growers claiming to use organic or clean green growing methods prompted investigation of possible sources. So organic does not mean pesticide free. Organic means typically that there is a smaller list of products that could be applied and still qualify the resulting plant material as organic. Now, reliable chemical analysis is important when we're looking at testing in general. So reliable chemical analysis of plant material before it's consumed is important to ensure the absence of pesticides. Cannabis uh, tested with confidence. Now, pesticide tolerance, when we're looking at other uh, materials, um, is definitely um, listed here. Apple, beef, egg, uh, grape, hops, and milk here. Then we're seeing the microbutanol, which is an active ingredient in Eagle 20. This is a broad spectrum. It's considered slightly hazardous. Uh, and then we have imaproclid, which is an insecticide uh, found in a brand name called Merit. It is called, it's considered to be moderately hazardous. So we see the comparisons of those two in these different crops here. We also see the um, marijuana e extracts here and uh, looking at kind of an idea of some of the changes that have occurred in comparison to some other crops as well. So again, important to understand pesticide tolerance levels uh, for different state regulations and that's going to appear on the analytical report as well. So let's use that microbutanil just as a quick example here. Microbutanil is the most prevalent pesticide detected and is most commonly used for the treatment of mold infestations, which sadly can be very common uh, in cannabis plants. The microbutanil is a fungicide that when present in cannabis plant material is smoked via cigarette, it is released via toxic gas, hydrogen cyanide. So this is why it's so um, of a high level of concern in cannabis, simply because when ignited, it's creating this hydrogen cyanide. It itself doesn't contain um, hydrogen cyanide because that's a gas. When you vaporize it, that induced heat is causing a change in the chemical structure to hydrogen cyanide. Very, very um, high level of concern. Now, state-by-state state lists, so again, keep this in mind, uh, check your local state regulations. Each state has its own list for pesticides which must be monitored in cannabis samples. California, for example, currently has a list of 66 pesticides which must be monitored where 21 in the list are in category one and should not be detected in cannabis products, while the other 45 pesticides in category two should not exceed indicated um, action levels at low parts per billion, PPB, lower limits of quantination. So again, knowing where that kind of falls, what pesticides fall in what category. Here we're looking at the distribution of clones, passing or failing, uh, California pesticide action limits. Green equals passing, red equals failure. So you can see the number of clones tested that passed or failed to propose California pesticide threshold from market um, reality in cannabis. The portion represents red, the graph is the total failure. So 77.4 failed, 22.6 did pass. It's also where we get into that kind of uh, gray area of if they're grown in California and shipped to somewhere else, will that impact whether they fail or they pass? But it's looking at California produced clones with California limits here. 
Now, cannabis chemical complexity. So separation and the use of mass spec are analytical methods that can help handle these complexities of the plant and also low parts per billion levels required by state regulations. Other analysis have been employed in the past for measuring some pesticides, uh, but typically your uh, mass spec techniques tend to be the ones that are in generally preferred. And there's gas uh, chromatography and there's liquid chromatography here, a little comparison between the two here uh, with that kind of mass spec chromatography, looking at the specifics here, a little different kind of processes, but still getting those um, results here at the end for comparison. Now, suggested techniques, just in general, so looking at all the options. In many cases, pesticide levels are in the mid to low parts per billion range, and this is looking at uh, liquid chromatography mass spec approach may be appropriate. For those samples containing very low parts per billion levels of unknown pesticides, it may be preferred to employ some of these techniques in high resolution mass spec, employing this uh, orbit trap as well. There's also, you can see here, recent uh, webinars looking at this importance of testing, looking at kind of getting this information out, and seeing and evaluating these different testing techniques to make sure labs are utilizing the most efficient ones possible. Now looking at these techniques for pesticide detection here, so not getting into too much of the details, but we can clearly see that there's a lot of um, availability to test here. In general, most state laboratories, including New York State, suggest the um, liquid chromatography mass spec techniques for the quantitative determination of pesticides in cannabis, hemp, and products derived from them. So keep in mind, this goes beyond of just the actual dry flower material. Any products derived from them should also be going through this same level of testing. This technology, coupled with recommended sample preparation, provides broad coverage with high sensitivity and also selectivity for the quantitative determination of over 100 pesticides. So it really allows a very efficient way to detect any presence of those pesticides on the plant samples submitted. So lastly, challenge with pesticide testing, just in general. The inherent challenge is that if the pesticide is not tested for, it could be present, but simply not identified. However, having cannabis plant material testing for the likely pesticide used is a very important step if it is just an initial step. Consumers should be uh, ensuring any product they're considering purchasing has the proper testing and this documentation is checked before buying and using that product. So just because they can't test for everything, if they're testing for a good subset of those samples and your um, proposed material passes all of those samples, it can be a good indication, at least for pesticides, that that sample is probably clean. Keep in mind there's other testing such as heavy metals and mycotoxins that should also be taken into consideration. This is just a look at educating you uh, on the specifics of pesticide testing in cannabis.